So, Robert, how about if I hand it to you first before I mean, I'll. Okay, welcome everyone to the Friday Transportation Seminar. I'm happy to see all of you. My name is Jennifer Dill. I'm a faculty member here in Urban Studies and Planning and director of OTREC. Um, we have a um, wonderful event planned uh, for today's seminar. First, I'm going to introduce Robert Liberty, who's director of the Sustainable Communities Initiative, uh, based at the University of Oregon, because today's speaker is a part is an event a partnership uh, between both uh, OTREC and SCI. So I'm going to hand it off to Robert briefly. Thank you, Jennifer, and I want to thank OTREC, uh, Oregon Transportation Research and Education Consortium and its successor, the National Institute for Transportation and Communities, led here from PSU. Sustainable Cities Initiative is a way in which we bring together the energy enthusiasm of students with the research capacity of faculty to try and advance the sustainability of cities in Oregon, the United States, and around the world. We have a couple different programs. One of them is this Expert in Residence program that we offer in partnership with OTREC and NITSI in the future. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that we receive generous support from some contributors uh, to the University of Oregon Foundation. So we're glad you're here, and I think you'll find it very stimulating. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so uh, there may be a few new faces in the room. Those of you who don't know, we do webcast these seminars, uh, which means there are people watching on the web. And uh, when we get to the point at the end to ask questions, I want to remind everyone to use the microphones on most of the desks. Hold the touch button, keep the red light lit while you're asking the question. Um, if for some reason your microphone does not exist or does not work, one of us will come around with this portable one so we can make sure the folks on the web can hear your insightful question. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, today's speaker. Jarrett Walker is an international consultant in public uh, transit network design and policy. He has been a full-time consultant since 1991 and has led numerous major planning projects in North America, Australia, and New Zealand. He currently serves as a principal consultant with M.R. Cagney based in Australia. Born in 1962, he grew up in Portland, Oregon during the revolutionary 1970s, an era when Portland first made its decisive commitment to be a city for people rather than cars. Passionately interested in an impractical number of fields, he is probably the only person with publications in both the Journal of Transport Geography and Shakespeare Quarterly. So I, I challenge anyone to better that. Um, in addition to human transit, he also writes on botany, creative writing, performing arts, and a range of other interests, and on his personal blog, Creature of the Shade. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jarrett Walker. I also want to make a couple of other comments by way of introduction. First of all, um, this book, Human Transit, um, is uh, much of what I'm going to summarize today. However, I'm going to talk about a few other things as well. So I always have to emphasize that listening to this presentation is not a substitute for reading the book. Uh, I have four of them for sale upstairs, and there are also quite a few of them available. I know in the UO bookstore. I'm not sure if they're also in PSU's bookstore. Um, having said that, Public transit, some questions, some new questions for Portland. I want to try to ask some questions that are different from maybe the questions that we're used to hearing about in the newspaper, used to reading about, used to thinking about. Um, now, normally, when I am in, and by the way, I promised that this would not be exactly the same content as I did last night, which is true. After about the first seven slides, we'll head off in a new direction. Um, but I do want to start with some of the same principles. Normally when I'm at a party or something like that and someone asks me what I do and I say that I'm a public transit planner, their next question is almost always, what do you think of insert technology, right? What do you think of monorails? What do you think of light rail? What do you think of streetcars? What do you think of these double-decker buses? There is the assumption that technology choice is the most important question in transit. All these technology choices. 
And it's understandable why people feel that way. Because whereas a lot of things about transit are both A, need a bit of explanation, and B, are never explained very clearly to the public, everybody can have an emotional reaction to a vehicle or a technology, and we're all used to doing that. So, um, so it's easy, and therefore it's easy for journalism as well to, to, to talk that way, and yet it is a false analogy with the experience of choosing personal vehicles. Above all, though, it contains this presumption uh, when, you, when you listen to people's opinions about technologies and then you run off and take that as direction to do something in particular in your transit network, you're presumed that people care about the vehicle more than they care about getting where they're going. So for example, when I'm a tourist and I'm off in, in Europe or something, yes, I'll tend to ride trams and trains more than I'll ride buses if I'm just riding around for, for pleasure because I enjoy riding trams and trains. But that's different from saying that I'll only ride trams or trains, or that riding trams or trains or some other favorite technology is actually more important than having access to a complete network that gets me wherever I'm going. We don't generally ask people if, that, if, if they want to make that trade-off when we take their opinion that, you know, trams are cool, streetcars are cool, monorails are cool, whatever, and start turning that into public policy. But that is really the trade-off. So for example, I'll tell you this funny story. If you get on a tram in Melbourne, Australia, what you'll see on the wall is this map. And setting aside the wisdom of uh, the graphic design wisdom of yellow lines on a white background, the larger issue raised by this map is that this is a map only of Melbourne's trams. So the assumption on that map, and you'll see lots of maps like this all around the world, the assumption of that, that map is that because I am on a tram, I am a tram person. Because I am on a tram, I, I am interested in trams. They are not open to the possibility that I may be on a tram because this is going where I'm going, right? And so I'm on it because it's, going, it's useful to me. Um, and if someone had that sort of radical, subversive point of view toward transit, that they're, that they're using a tram not because they're tram people, but just because the tram goes where they're going, then they would much rather see a map of the entire transit network here, or at least the entire frequent network, a map that shows some sense of the whole utility of being able to get around Melbourne on transit. Whereas a tram person, if we're a tram person, would of course look at this map and conclude that if you want to go from there to there, of course you're going to go like this, because that's the only way to do it, and stay on trams. Interesting trade-off. So we have this constant struggle in the transit industry with people who have this intuitive response, which is, what a great vehicle or technology. OK, where do we put it? As opposed to, what kind of service or capacity or network are we trying to create? What kind of outcomes are we trying to create? OK, what technology best provides that? Um, so and the interesting thing is, Actual studies get commissioned with this scope. A few years ago, there was something called the Portland Streetcar uh, System Plan or something like that, and it had exactly this scope. We love streetcars, therefore, where can we put them? Uh, it was not actually a network study. It was a study about extending streetcars as far as possible, which is a slightly different, uh, a slightly different purpose. Now, I want to briefly pause over this, and then after this, we're going to go off in a new direction. Um, one of the things that makes it hard for ordinary citizens or even, or even policymakers to really get their heads around transit is that we don't talk about the product of transit very well. We don't talk very well about, we talk a lot about its secondary outcomes, VMT reduction, um, emissions reduction, um, support for sustainable reform, all that stuff, but we don't talk very much about the thing that it delivers that causes people to, that, that, that people use and, that th and that thus delivers those outcomes. Um, and I think it's something like abundant access or the, the ability to, or the freedom to access your city and access the riches of your city with a certain degree of convenience. And that's why I'm very interested in this tool, which is sitting in beta inside walkscore.com, but which is, you're going to see versions of increasingly. This little tool is designed so that you can uh, select a time of day, plop down a pointer, and it will show you isochrones of where you can go, how far you can go in a particular amount of time, 15, 30, 45, on transit plus walking. Now, I find this a very compelling image to play with because this is a map of your freedom. 
and freedom is an appropriate word. When we trans take the concept of freedom and translate it into transportation, we're talking about, well, some people say it's the freedom to move, which is why we all need SUVs so we can just drive off and move. Um, but in, in urban life, it's much more about the freedom to actually access the riches of your city. And this map shows you very viscerally how much of the riches of your city are available to you based on where you choose to locate. I'm going to suggest, uh, uh, should we ask some people to move forward so that there's place for latecomers to sit? This is a basic theater uh, experience that folks always cram up near the door so that latecomers can't have nowhere to, to go. So if, if some people could move forward, we're safe in the front row. Um, uh, but just remember that latecomers will be coming in and try to help them do that. Um, now one thing that's useful for is location decisions. And I would like to see every realtor uh, instead of using that simplistic two-digit transit score, which doesn't say much of anything, actually give home buyers access to this tool and let them play around and see the consequences of locating in different places. Because one of the most urgent messages to convey is that your transit mobility is primarily a consequence of your location, and you need to take responsibility for those consequences when you choose to locate. This is a huge issue for senior citizens, for example. Uh, the aging baby boom that we all worry about, where people who are making what is possibly their last locational choice need to be thinking about what it will be like to live in this place when perhaps they can no longer drive or no longer want to drive. Um, so you can see very quickly the consequences of locating, say, downtown or out in the east side grid where things, uh, or, for example, um, out in a leafy suburb like Vermont Hills. And it's interesting, I've been doing some house shopping, and Vermont Hills is now a lot cheaper than, say, Multnomah Village. Uh, that has flipped around in the last 10, 15 years, and obviously it may have something to do with the fact that if you're in Multnomah Village, your blobs are con considerably larger. So what if transit's task were to grow these blobs for the greatest number of people? What if we were trying to expand people's freedom? What if we were trying to expand the answer to the question, how much of the city in all its richness is available to me, to each of us? And one of the things to notice is that this map is not, is presuming that technology and vehicle choice are actually irrelevant. Um, all, it, this doesn't mean that, you, that it assumes that you don't like streetcars or that you don't like aerial trams or whatever. That's not the assumption. The assumption is that um, even more than you like those things, you like getting where you're going. And this is a map of your ability to actually get where you're going. And I think if people were, were encouraged to play with this map, they would start to see the actual trade-offs involved in different kinds of, of proposals. OK, off in a new direction. The basic contention of my book, Human Transit, is that if we're going to make good transit policy, we need to listen to our tools. Now, that may sound like an odd way to put it, so let me unpack that a little bit. Everyone in this room probably has some sort of hobby or craft. Maybe it's gardening. Maybe it's carpentry. Maybe it's something completely different, like music. Maybe it's, um, you know, it, it could be all kinds of things. But some kind of creative activity in which you interact with some kind of material. <coughs> And the first thing you learn when you come in to, and start, and start uh, learning a craft like that is that your head is going to have lots of beautiful visions of what the perfect this or that would look like. But that's actually not the great act of creativity. That's actually not the work. The work is actually having a dialogue with your material in which you figure out how to make that material do what you want. And inevitably, as you get to know the material, you find that the material talks back to you and, and presents you with certain choices, right? I mean, if I could, I could go out to my garden in Portland and say, I've decided I want a lush tropical garden with palm trees and bananas and so on. And I'm going to have to make some choices about that. Like, do I build a green? That, that may mean I have to build a greenhouse. Or, that, or maybe that means that I need to compromise on that and choose some plants that sort of look a little bit lush and tropical, but that will actually survive here. So you're constantly having a conversation with the substance that you're working with. And it is the substance that is asking you questions about what you really want. And particularly, the nature of the material is presenting you with the real trade-offs that you have to answer, right? So translate this idea into transit. It is not enough for us as a community 
or for a bunch of elected officials or for, or for any sort of group in, you know, in some sort of retreat or workshop or something to just hammer out a mission statement and some goal statements and some visions. That's nice, but what really matters is how you answer the actual questions that arise out of the material. Right? So, so listen to your tools is one of my contentions. I contend that as we listen to the tool of public transit, and fundamentally, even more than um, fun vehicles and technologies, the tool of tr tools of public transit are more fundamental than that. They are the line, the frequency, the duration, the various ways that lines can be configured, how the ways that lines fit into networks via what we call connections. Those are the tools. Those are, if you will, the erector set or the tinker toys that we have to work with or the Lego set that we have to work with to build whatever it is we want. And if we think about those tools and understand them, we find that they ask us certain hard questions. And that if we can get decision makers, elected officials, which requires citizens too, to think about these particular questions that are the actual questions that the material asks, then if we answer those questions, our answers can actually be implemented. A, bo a board, for example, if it answers these particular questions, gives its staff a direction that the staff can actually follow and document. So I'm going to talk about four of these. The trade-off of connections or complexity, the trade-off of ridership or coverage, the trade-off of peak first versus all day thinking, and the trade-off, the grand trade-off really, of diversity or specialization. And I want to emphasize right away, all through this, although all sorts of interesting cultural issues will arise out of it, I'm actually talking entirely about facts of geometry. And that's important to remember, because although geometry is not very sexy, it is something you can take to the bank. And uh, it, uh, it has your back. It's not going to change. It's the same even on other planets. And in fact, um, and in fact, you can Google a, an article of mine called How Universal is Transit's Geometry, where I go through a thought experiment about imagining a civilization on another planet, making just a couple of assumptions about it, and deriving that, they must have all, that, that their transport services must have all these same geometric features that we, are, that we know here. Um, the beautiful thing about emphasizing geometry is that it helps everyone understand that there's no fighting back against that. And that if a political, and that when an elected official comes in and, and demands that we should do something that is geometrically impossible, enough people around need to be able to recognize that that's what that is and say that back. So connections are complexity. Um, when a little transit system gets started, especially if it's starting with a rather commute-focused objective. It may start like this. Here's a very sim simplified city, three neighborhoods that people live in, three destinations, downtown College Mall. And the way you might start serving this area would be, well, people want to go from every neighborhood to every destination, so we need a line from every neighborhood to every destination. So you start out with a network of nine lines, and let's suppose that means you can only run them every 30 minutes. And then some consultant comes in and says something really wacky like, wait a minute, what if you just ran three lines? And the three lines connected at a certain point so that you could get from any origin to any destination via that connection. But you're making people transfer. You're making people get off. You're making people move. I mean, why in the world would you do that? Well, here's why. Um, if we have three lines instead of nine, we can run them three times as often. So these lines run every 10 minutes. Right? at the same budget. And once you, if you actually count your travel time from the time at which you would actually like to leave, which is a random, random time, then you have to count at the beginning of your trip the average wait time determined by the frequency. Right? So that means here, you're gonna, it's only every 30 minutes, so average wait of 15 minutes just to get started, and then a, let's call this a 20-minute trip. That's, tw uh, that's 35 minutes. Here, wait five minutes because it's every 10. Right? Just wait five minutes, ride 10, transfer, wait another five minutes, ride 10, 30 minutes. This one is faster, even though it requires the connection. And this is why the TriMet network works the way it does, or at least worked the way it did until um, the last few years of budget cuts. The, um, it, this is why in, in Portland, for example, you have, if you look at a street like Division or Hawthorne, there is exactly one bus route on it. And the principle, or one transit line, and the principle of that is that you can, you'll use this line to go anywhere in the network, not just to points on this line. 
because the network is designed to make it easy to make a connection. Now, I should have shown you here, I've worked a lot in Sydney, Australia. And Sydney, Australia has done the world a great favor by modeling what an urban transit system would be like if you grow to a city of 4 million people and remain totally terrified of asking anyone to ever make a connection. It is massively, massively confusing. All of the route numbers are four digits, sometimes with little letter extensions. They, are, uh, um, they have hundreds and hundreds of routes covering about the same area as Portland. I think TriMet has fewer than 100 routes. Um, uh, because TriMet is, is so relatively simple. So what they have achieved is complexity as a result of avoiding connections. They have also sacrificed frequency because when you're running hundreds and hundreds of routes, you can't afford to run any of them very frequently. And it is a massively, massively confusing uh, network to try to navigate. In fact, it's not really a network at all. It's just a pile of lines. Um, and I talk to Sydney about this, and I give them some of the same presentation when I'm down there, and we're gradually pulling them along. Again, this trade-off's a fact of transit geometry. Here's another example, the peak or all day question. You have some kind of peaking pattern. There's a commute, and then there's stuff happening in between. There's stuff happening in the evening. There's stuff happening on the, on the weekend. How do you think about that? If you're coming from a suburban transit operator perspective, this would be quite a lively conversation at CTRAN, for example. The political constituency for transit, especially the vocal one, is likely to be very fixated on the commute as the main thing transit is supposed to do. And so you'll have a lot of pressure to run basically a commute service, and then in between you may run something lesser or inferior called the off-peak. Uh, this shows up sometimes when you see transit agencies put out services that only run from 9 a.m. To, to 2 p.m. Um, and that are specifically for, you know, helping poor, helpless people get around in that little time when you have some buses to spare. On the other hand, if you're really interested in building a strong transit-reliant city where sustainable, transit mo where sustainable transport modes in general are readily available, you can rely on them, and you can therefore own fewer cars or depend on cars less, you want a reliable all-day network that's running all the time, and then you may add a little peak service on top of it. The interesting thing is these are totally different perspectives. And, and this is one of those cases where if you hear two people t arguing about a transit issue and seeming both very frustrated and yelling at each other and, uh, and, and, and you start analyzing what they're saying, you often find that they have answers to different questions and that, they're actually, and that they think they're disagreeing about the answer when they're actually disagreeing about the question. And this is a common example where somebody who thinks that transit is about the peak is talking to somebody who is interested in this all day, constantly available transit, and they're not even aware that, aware that that's what they're disagreeing about. So one of the reasons to offer these kinds of tools is to help you at least understand what you're disagreeing about, so that you can have the real conversation about the real choice. Ridership or coverage. Um, it is the case that the goal of a high ridership system um, and the goal of a system that serves everyone are in conflict. They are geometrically irreconcilable. They are different networks. A, high, a, a coverage network, is, um, which is driven by something like a minimum service standard, that's a standard that says something like percentage of the population that was within such and such a distance of service, that standard leads to service being spread out very thinly. That means you run lots and lots of service, most of it not very frequent, because again, you're running lots of route miles and therefore can't afford to run them very frequently. You've divided your resources over a lot of area. Um, that tends to be a low ridership system. In fact, when you're out in low density and low ridership potential territory, and that's not just low density, but it's also, for example, obstructive street patterns that make it hard to walk to service and that also make it hard for service to cycle through the neighborhood. When you're in that kind of development pattern, I guarantee you this is not just a low ridership service, it's a permanently and predictably low ridership service. And transit agencies spend much too much of their time apologizing to their boards about that and giving their boards the illusion that, oh, we'll just continue try marketing or something and that will somehow make this better. No, the real message to the board is the, the low performance of this service is geometrically inevitable because there are not very many people around it. And it, and it has a lot of obstacles to go through. One of the simplest questions you can ask to help an ordinary person start to grasp this problem is how far do we have to drive to serve 1,000 people, right? Hawthorne Boulevard, what, 300 feet or something, right? Um, 
you know, Northwest 23rd, about 50 feet, um, driving around Damascus, perhaps a couple of miles, driving to Estacada, uh, seven or eight miles. And that's directly related. And you can also notice how driving in an area where people can't walk to the service means you're serving fewer people, therefore you have to drive further. You can also see how driving around in a highly obstructed network, like some of the, there's a magnificent cul-de-sac in, in Beaverton called Greenbrier. You should go have a look at it on, the, uh, on Google Earth. It's about three quarters of a mile long. It is lined with major, major employment, and you just have to turn around at the end and drive all the way back. So if you have to drive around in circles to serve all these people, that too counts against that measure. How far do I have to drive to serve 1,000 people? So it's a nice, just quick, intuitive way to get people thinking about what really boils down to transit efficiency. So the ridership versus coverage trade-off works basically like this. Um, if you're valuing coverage, you are intentionally saying that you want to run infrequent local routes covering low density areas with predictably low ridership. Now there are a couple of great reasons to do that, and I am not telling anyone in this room that they shouldn't want that. I'm just observing that you have to manage the fact that it is in conflict with the other goal of ridership. The two main reasons why people tend to want this are social inclusion, that is the needs of transit dependent people who happen to live out there including, for example, senior citizens who chose to retire in a place where their access wasn't going to be very good. And also the, simply the self-interest of low-density areas we pay taxes to, et cetera, et cetera, that create this sort of problem, that they create the need for this kind of service. And I would argue that one of the main things that land use planning and structure planning and the real estate industry should all be obsessed with is helping people understand when they choose to settle in a low ridership area that that means they're going to have poor transit service. It really should be in your title. It really should be, or in your, or in your lease. You really should have to sign something that says, I understand this. The ridership goal, on the other hand, imagine that a transit uh, agency were trying to maximize its ridership. Now, a lot of the critiques we get of transit, like from the, from the Wendell Cox um, um, conservative world, a lot of those critiques are saying, actually, um, uh, look how poorly transit is doing in, rider, in terms of ridership, falsely assuming that all of transit services are trying to maximize their ridership, which is, of course is not what they're trying to do. Some of them are, are devoted to coverage. If you were focused entirely on ridership, you would run only those services that form a network that, that, that maximize ridership, and you would probably not get very far outside the city of Portland. Probably you would have max. Um, at, least out, uh, you know, at least out beyond Beaverton. I'm not sure it would get to Hillsborough. I'm not sure it would get to Gresham. But you would have a very limited area of service focused on the dense parts of the region, and then you would have extremely high levels of service providing a very high level of convenience. You would probably also have some peak express services from outer areas, which tend to be busy, high ridership only on the peak. But what the, high, what the ridership goal generally optimizes is competition with the car and therefore all the sustainable transport outcomes. It also uh, optimizes fare revenue, so it minimizes subsidy. Um, and it also produces a lot of positive feedbacks over the long term. And I'll come back to positive feedback effects in a moment. But one of the things I love about this, and I've been working with transit agency boards for about 10 years on helping them think about this. And in a couple of cases, I've got them to actually adopt policies that say, OK, eight, for, with 80% of our budget, we want you to maximize, go chase ridership wherever it is. And then with the other 20%, let's fill in a little bit of coverage. One of the nice things about adopting that policy is then if your city is continuing to sprawl, you have a reason not to just keep pouring more and more money into the coverage side to cover the new low ridership sprawl. You have a reason to stay focused on your high ridership network. Um, one of the other things I love about this trade-off is that in environments that are highly polarized between liberals and conservatives, this completely cuts across that polarization and requires them, people to organize themselves in a different way because there are both liberal and conservative reasons to prefer both sides. Right? Um, these kinds of you know, squishy green granola outcomes are, are like sustainability are characteristically leftist. But on the other hand, so is the goal of social inclusion, care for the needs of the disabled, you know, responding to fundamental social needs. On the other hand, fair revenue, minimizing subsidy, uh, approaching the, the, the Thatcherite ideal of everything being profitable and nothing having to be paid for, uh, is a conservative fantasy. And, but also, over here, 
the low density areas that uh, demand all of this low ridership service tend in general to vote more conservatively. In fact, residential density is a remarkably good predictor of voting behavior in this country. So you have, you have reasons to cut both ways and some very interesting outcomes as a result. And it becomes a very good conversation if you can have it. Finally, I want to talk briefly about diversity or specialization because this is pretty fundamental. The most successful transit services in terms of ridership tend to be services designed to serve as many different people and trips and purposes with each line as possible. Think about one of the big heavy light rail lines or one of Portland's big major bus lines like Hawthorne or Belmont and just observe the diversity of different purposes that it's serving all at once. Transit is successful to the extent that it appeals to many different people doing many different things. Thus, the contrary to diversity is specialization. And the problem is that our political system and the way we self-organize politically tends to lead us into form different groups who want different kinds of transit service just for ourselves. Right? And so I've had lots of experience with transit lines designed around specific ethnic groups. Uh, specific income groups, for example, the whole price versus luxury trade-off, we need to have several different classes of service, right? Uh, neighborhood groups, interest groups, developments, uh, d and developers and architects, of course. Uh, electoral districts, Los Angeles has to have a little dash shuttle going around in circles in every single city council district, um, regardless of whether they're of any use. Electoral district, government agencies. Government agencies, Los Angeles has a little dash shuttle running around every neighborhood because this is the city of Los Angeles instead of that big, bad Los Angeles County Metro. And, and these the, it's inevitable the narcissism of government assumes that all citizens are obsessed, are obsessed about this difference are as obsessed about the distinction between the city of Los Angeles and Los Angeles County as the people who work for them are. Many people just want to get where they're going. So here's a great, uh, here's a fundamental principle. The grid, the high frequency grid, it's a network for everyone. If you think of, if, uh, it's a mathematical fact that for maximum abundance of service without picking favorites, without having to say inside our service planning conversation, well, really, these people are going over there, and these people are going over there, and these people are going over there. No. So quit talking about that. We want everyone to get everywhere. That's the principle that led to the east side grid, which went in in 1982, and I contend that is at least as important as light rail for forming Portland in the way that it is now. Um, the mathematical idea here is that if you have a high frequency pattern of north, south, and east, west services intersecting, then from absolutely any point A to absolutely any point B, the trip is the same. It's a walk to a ride, and again, a short wait because it's a high frequency grid. Then you connect a short wait because it's a high frequency grid. Then you ride a little further. Then you walk. That is the recipe for absolutely any trip between any two points anywhere. And what I love about the grid is that um, I've sat in so many meetings listening to planners talking about, you know, they've gotten a lot of transport planning data and they've looked at, at desire lines and so on, and they're obsessed with chopping up the market, right? Chopping it up as finely as they can. But that's not how you build great transit systems. You build great transit systems by then putting those markets back together, right? And because what, so often what happens is that chopping up of, of the market leads to the, to, to the creation of specialized services. That's how Sydney got where it is. You know, the planners thought they knew that people were going from here to there, so they ran a bus from here to there. And then thought people were going from here to there, so they ran a bus from here to there. It doesn't add up to a network. You can only use it. You can only use it if you're in one of those demographic categories that the planners have evaluated. But in a big, complicated city, all those little markets that may have been enumerated, which may be slightly larger than average, may still add up to a small plurality of everything people are doing, everywhere people want to go in the city. Now, obviously, this has to be efficient, which is why lines have to be far apart to avoid overlapping each other. For example, when I was a kid, there was a bus line out southeast Stark, in addition to Belmont, in addition to Burnside. When the, when the grid was put in, in in 1982, the Stark line was ripped out, and it has to stay out because it's too close to Belmont or Burnside. Those, it, those are overlapping markets, which then dissipate the frequency. And the frequency is what makes the whole thing work. Even cities without a regular grid try to get regular grid effects. San Francisco has a massive bank of hills right there in the city. And you can see at the street network, it's all contorted trying to deal with it. But watch line 48 carefully try to struggle to remain on the same line of latitude as it goes across the city. Watch line 43 with greater difficulty struggle to remain on the same line of longitude as it goes across the city. 
San Francisco planners grasped the grid so fundamentally that they actually worked hard to fit the grid even to some fairly hostile geography because they wanted this basic outcome. Funny story about specialization around the low end, the 305 story. Um, Jennifer Medina in the New York Times uh, a few months ago did an article all about a bus line in Los Angeles, the 305. And what she wanted us to be upset about was that Metro, LA Metro was planning to cut a bus line that runs directly from Watts to Beverly Hills. Now, obviously, if, if you know anything about Los Angeles, you know that if somebody says Watts to Beverly Hills, you understand that this is going to be a sentence about race or class, and that we're going to have a conversation about demographic or cultural categories. And so this was understood as being a brutal attack on the poor people in Watts who need to get to their jobs helping, seniors, helping rich people in Beverly Hills, when in fact it isn't any of that. Because what it really is is this. It's a, it's a line that runs every 40 minutes, sitting on top of a grid of lines that run every 5 to 15 minutes. So yes, it does this, but only every 40 minutes. If you just missed one, it'll be much faster to go that way on the high frequency grid than to wait for the next one of these little things. So this is an example of what I call symbolic transit. Symbolic in the sense that the, the purpose of it is to say, what's to Beverly Hills? In other words, we understand that and are serving the needs of poor people who are domestics, right? But you see what that's done. Specialization is the very essence of it. They've drawn a line specifically for just a small group of people. And the, and the resources that go into that line come at the expense of just making the grid more frequent so that everyone could get where they were going. Um, that's, so that's what I mean by symbolic transit. Another example I mentioned, the circulators. Every Los Angeles City Council district has to have a little bus driving around in circles brought to you by the city of Los Angeles as opposed to the Los Angeles County Metro System. The Los Angeles County Metro System is running a big high frequency grid over the top of this. But in addition, we have this old dinky bus that goes around in a particular loop. Um, so you, there's a lot in my book about the typology of loops in general and the underlying psychology of loops. I won't talk too much more about that. But it's a total duplication. So I want to come back to how the questions align, the four questions I've talked about. You really can choose to be wherever you want to be on these four axes. Nevertheless, one of the ways to think about how difficult the process will be to create quality out of your transit network is to plot the sort of blob that's created by where you are on each axis. And if you plot that blob, the reality is that the larger that blob is, the more internally conflicted your transit system is, the more spread out and ultimately less frequent, less useful it's going to be for the general public trying to go anywhere. Um, that's why, to the extent that you're focused on all day instead of peak, connections instead of complexity, diversity instead of specialization, and ridership instead of coverage, you're pulling inward. And as the circle gets smaller, that means more and more positive feedback among those various elements, right? As all of these four choices support each other and create a stronger and stronger system and also support all the land use choices that we want people to make and all of the sustainable transport choices that we'd like people to make. I'm going to end with a quick note on another example of symbolic transit, just because I think it's so important to notice. Um, another example of, of the idea of symbolic transit, which I would define as service that is designed to symbolize abundant access at the expense of providing abundant access. You know, it's, you're, trading away, you're trading away the thing you want in order to have a symbol of it. Uh, what we see a lot, especially in the urban design world, when urban designers are creating transit systems uh, that work well with their developments, is that they tend to like that oncoming directions of service should be further apart. And the reason they say this is especially when we're talking about sort of officially sexy or attractive model, uh, models of transit like streetcars, is that if the oncoming directions are further apart, you're touching more real estate basically, right? You have more street frontages in which you can photograph this vehicle in front of your development. You're activating, as they say, more territory. And, and, and it gives a compelling illusion that as the oncoming directions get further apart, that's more service. But anyone who's actually used transit knows that you need to be able to walk to both directions of service in order to be able to use it at all, right? You have to go and then come back. So, in fact, the area, the, the area in pink here which is the area that can walk to both directions, gets smaller as you pull the directions apart. So this is a nice example where this compelling symbol of mobility 
the vehicle and the way it activates the street frontage and the way it conveys to people the impression or symbol of mobility produces exactly the opposite outcome, precisely the opposite outcome from planning based on creating actual abundant access, which requires keeping the two directions together. Um, thanks very much. Happy to take some questions. use the microphone. If you don't have one, I'll come and share mine. So, assuming that your city has to provide some level of transit to low density outer lying areas, what would your suggestion be for addressing those parts of the city without um, building inefficiency into the rest of your transit system? The only way you can do it because the conflict is geometrically inevitable, what that means is the only way you can do it is to have a clear conversation about dividing your resources and actually create some sort of designated space in your budget that is specifically for doing that. And then don't use ridership as a performance indicator for those services because that's not their purpose. You know? um, assess them against their purpose, which is really just existence in relation to a certain amount of development. So that so the, the performance indicator indicator is really just availability of service within a walk, this walking distance of this number of people. Um, one of the things that always happens when I raise this is someone always says, well, but what if we use dial a ride? Yeah, it's a wonderful kind of denial. You know, can we make this problem go away by choosing another tool? No, you can't. dial a ride is a wonderful tool. Demand responsive service is a wonderful tool. Uh, it doesn't fundamentally change the, the, the geometric fact. Of, of that low ridership service is low ridership service. Um, the only other solution to this that I know of is to find a way for low ridership service to be run at a lower operating cost. And it's important to remember that operating cost is mostly labor, so this has to mean paying drivers less to drive smaller buses. I actually think that's a good idea. Vancouver, BC has led in this. They have created with their union an exceptional deal which says something that should be extremely logical to all of us, which is when you first start in a profession, you should work out, you should do something easy and not very risky before you start doing things that are harder and riskier. The traditional structure of the bus driving job is exactly the opposite. Everything is about seniority. So when you first get on and start driving a bus, you're like you're going to be driving, you're going to be having the driving job that nobody else wants, which is probably like a big articulated bus crammed with people going down a, a, a semi-congested freeway, the highest risk thing you can be doing goes to the most junior driver, right? And then as they progress through the, through the profession, they get paid more as they also get more seniority so they can choose easier work. So finally, when you're 60 years old or whatever and you're, you know, you're, you're drawing down the top pay and benefits in the profession, you're driving around South Beaverton or something and you, know, you only have five passengers all day and you know them all by name and you're having a good time. But that's not how professions are supposed to work, right? They're supposed to get harder as you go. <laughs> and as you get paid more, you're supposed to have more responsibility. So actually the idea of a training wage, especially because in the private sector, this is universal. In the private sector, everybody understands. Think about what airlines do. You, of course, you fly a little plane for a while before you fly a big plane. So there's a nexus there of an argument, which I think can start to, needs to be raised to unions and that unions need to be thinking about, because this is a way that they can be taking a lot less blame for service cuts if they're finding a way to make at least that kind of, of low ridership small bus territory more viable. Other question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier uh, the things you were talking about with transit kind of create a f positive feedback loop. And you mentioned um, briefly that um, one of the main impacts uh, that you saw long term was how it impacted city design. Could you mm -hmm. elaborate on that just a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, if you want transit to, inf in to, in to influence urban design, it needs to be of such a quality that its presence creates a certain kind of market for, for development. Now, right now, we rely very heavily on symbolic transit to do that. That's what the streetcar is, right? It's symbolic of mobility, and therefore, it's, and it's hyped up in a way that then causes it to successfully galvanize development, because right now, people are responding to the symbol. Um, however, we also know that, I mean, think about the Belmont Dairy Project at 33rd, 34th, and Belmont. That is transit-oriented development, although it is just a bus line. 
Um, it doesn't always get called transitory development, but fundamentally that's what it is. You look at it, you look at its parking ratios, you understand that it would not happen without one of Portland's most frequent bus lines right there outside the door. So a lot of the work, I think, is about making high quality service more visible. This is why, Portland, this is why TriMet invented the frequent network brand um, about 10 years ago now, so that it could start to become more obvious that these are the places you want to locate if you want really good access. Um, if, if it, uh, I, so I think we know that lots of people are making location decisions based on total access outcomes, which, in, which respect buses as much as streetcars, which value buses as much as streetcars. But there's a larger process. It is a great struggle to make this visible further up the line toward the elites who are less aware that this process is actually happening and that the whole network, the outcomes of the whole network are really mattering. How you handle situations like Portland or other communities where they have like a free rail or certain free areas? Because like I know I walk like 15 minutes to a free max line instead of a bus that stops in front of my apartment. Um, look, the, the f there are arguments for free fare zones, um, but those arguments tend to be hard to sustain when the alternative is to slash service even more. So right now, when we're in this extremely brutal budget environment, as TriMet is having to make such severe cuts, that's looking like a low-hanging fruit of a thing you can eliminate. And I would expect the rail free fare zone to probably be gone pretty soon. Uh, having said that, there is also an, you do have to also think carefully about one of the things you have to think about is, do you want transit to be used for that very short trip within downtown? You know, less than a mile. Um, because that's really a very hard trip to serve. The only way you serve that trip effectively is to be incredibly frequent, a bus coming every minute or two, so that there's always service, or a rail coming every minute, so there's always service coming. Think about the mall redesign. I don't know, if, for those of you who were around before 2008 and remember the mall as it used to be, one of the interesting things that happened there was that there was a decision that local those local trips along the mall, Max would do that. There's going to be lots and lots of MAX trains going up and down the ball, and they'll just use those. Well, first of all, they couldn't afford to run MAX trains anywhere near frequently enough to actually function that way. What's more, in the old mall, we had something very useful that was discarded. And that was the fact that I could walk out here, and there were two stops. And between one of those two stops, either of which I could get to in response to a bus showing up there, there was a bus coming every couple of minutes because the service was very concentrated and uh, very concentrated on the mall. It was all buses. But, you, but if you actually measure the access outcome, like how fast can you get, counting waiting time, can you get from here to, to say, 6th and Burnside? That has gone, that, that time has blown out. That has gotten much slower because we've given up that extreme frequency that we used to have because all the buses were concentrated here. And so there was always a bus coming. Other comments? Jennifer. I will uh, convey a question from the web, which relates a little bit to two questions ago, um, about using transit as a development tool. Um, the question is, it seems as though the grid works best in an existing urban area, but what about using it as a tool in developing green fields into urban-type neighborhoods where transit is used and valued? If there is one reason to be optimistic about Phoenix or Salt Lake City, or, out, or, or the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles, or even a lot of eastern suburbs of Los Angeles, it is the grid. Cities that have continued to build, and, and a number of, of Intermountain West cities especially, have had this fundamental planning principles that we will just keep extending this half mile grid of arterials forever. And as we do suburban sprawl, we can sprawl however developers will want to sprawl, but there will always be this half mile grid of arterials. Sound walled, hideous, pedestrian hostile, uh, bike hostile, um, narcissistic, dysfunctional, dangerous, polluted, horrible, whatever you want to dump on that on those kinds of suburbs. The fact is, that's all frosting compared to the fact that there is a hard grid there in the arterial network. And that means you can retrofit everything else over time. And, you'll ha and, and, and you can gradually grow the high-frequency grid out into that space. This was always the intention at TriMet, right? That, 
Um, you know, one of the courageous and important decisions that was made in building the east side grid is that we would include a crosstown grid line on 122nd, which at that time, 1982, was well beyond the territory where you know, anyone would expect very high ridership. Uh, I hope you all know that in the last 30 years since I was a kid living here, property values have almost completely inverted in most parts of Portland. So I have this vivid memory as a child of my parents were poor, star were starving artists, frankly, and they had other starving artist friends. And I remember to being taken to visit a friend who lived in what felt like a haunted house where everything was falling down, and she had you know the, the upholstery spewing the, the, the uh, old couch spewing upholstery on the front uh, porch and all of that stuff, and uh, and realizing how how much poorer she was even than we were at that time, and I, then I have to just hold my head really hard and remember, okay, that house was one block south of Hawthorne on 35th Avenue. It's now worth a million dollars at least. And on the other hand, you know, where we grew up in Mata Villa on, the wrong, on what was then the right side of Mount Tabor, the safe side of Mount Tabor, the suburban side of Mount Tabor, is now the wrong side of Mount Tabor, relatively speaking. It has all switched around. And what, and what was at the time in 1982 reaching way out into what was really, you know, affluent, relatively affluent, low-density suburbia when you're out on 122nd Avenue, is now, of course, in many ways, I don't want to call it the new ghetto exactly, but it is, a now, it is now the classic inner ring suburbia where there are lots of people who can't afford to live any closer, and they are out there having fairly desperate transport needs. And the urgency of transport in the inner ring is so much about the fact that there are lots of people out there who, who, are, who have to own a car because transit is not there for them. And you know, think about all the benefits of like being able to, for a family in that situation, to be able to like sell a car and therefore send a kid to college. You know, there are a lot of there's a lot of stake in the inner ring, and that's very important to focus on. Zef, uh, I think uh, th I've seen an issue with TriMet that in uh, in Portland we're very proud of regionalism, regional thinking. We have Metro, and we have this regional transit transit agency. Um, which has a lot of advantages, but I think part of the reason why we have a lot of coverage service is because that whole large area is paying taxes, and they all want some level of service. And so it's kind of made me wonder whether there's an advantage to having different cities be able to have their own transit agencies so they can have their own level of taxation that fits their needs, they can have their own strategies. Mm -hmm. And you've seen this in Wilsonville where they've They've now pulled out of TriMet, and they have their own agency with small buses that are maybe a, more appropriate. So I'm wondering if you can talk about the trade-off between the complexity of having multiple transit agencies versus the advantages that can come from that. Um, there are lots of ways to square that problem. And there are lots of ways to decentralize the funding and decision-making about levels of service city by city without necessarily destroying the network effects that come from the system working together. There is the whole, there is there are regional planning models. The German Verkehrsverbund model comes to mind, where there is a strong central planning control over the basic structure of the network. But if we did that in Portland, the equivalent might be that you know the Verkehrsverbund would be responsible for making sure that say the Macadam line and the connection from Lake Oswego over to Tigard work in a certain way. But the little buses that go around the lake and go into the nooks and crannies of Lake Oswego might be totally the responsibility of Lake Oswego. Right. That would be, and then they could make the decision about how much of that they wanted. It would be an internal argument in Lake Oswego. They would not be sort of yelling at some big bad government that's uh, doing something to them. They'd have to make the decision themselves. I want to just emphasize a, a, a really cruel but in, in other ways inspiring fact of life. If you think about the basic relationship between density and transit demand, let me point out two things. First of all, at higher densities, there are more people around every stop, right? So all of the, uh, if, 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 if point A is, if this area is twice as dense as that area, that means there are twice as many people around every stop. So even if there were no other relationship between density and demand, it would be logical to expect a basically linear relationship. Whatever the propensity is to use service, you'll, always ha you'll obviously have more riders if there are simply more people, right? More happen. But independently of that, um, think about the way that a single person living in different densities is going to have a different response to transit, right? If you live at higher density, driving is more of a hassle. 
you have much more of your, of your daily needs met by walking and cycling, and as a result, you have less need to own a car. That makes you more open to using transit for the other kinds of longer trips that you need to make. Um, there is such a, and, and by comparison, in the low density area, driving is just so easy. So you expect that independent of that relationship, there's got to be some other kind of positive relationship. And we're not really sure whether it's linear or curved, right? Let's pretend it's linear. Well, the product of two linear relationships is an upward curve. And what's interesting is that this holds pretty well until you get up to about a, a, to a density like downtown Portland, where everything becomes walkable. And at that point, this starts flattening out. Because, of course, at those extreme densities, you stop using transit very much because you can walk to almost every, anything. What does that mean? Well, there are very few models. There are many models of transit funding and transit governance that basically work, say that, that you know, it's about this. <laughs> you know, that, that we should have sort of the same level of service everywhere. But in California, there are lots of transit boards, for example, where each city has one vote on the board regardless of size, right? So that, you know, some little tiny enclave city has the same of power as the city of Riverside, for example, or the city of San Bernardino. And that leads to just totally horizontal. On the other hand, once you get past that, there's the temptation to try to draw a vertical, a, a straight line, a sort of service proportional to population. Doesn't that seem fair? Well, it does, except that here you're going to have empty buses, and here you're still going to have overcrowding. Right? Make sense? So we ultimately have to find our way to fit service to the curve itself. And what that generally mean, ends up meaning in, in the context of regional governance is that the inner city municipality is going to have to have its own funding increment on top of what the region can do. That is ultimately a better solution than the inner city seceding or in anybody trying to secede because that just creates a mess of, of poor connections and dysfunctionality and going different directions. And that's, I think, the direction it's going to have to go. We have a small step in that direction now in the sense that the city of Portland funds a portion of the operating cost of the streetcar, which is just obviously an increment that they particularly value. Seattle has finally broken out of a funding package that actually cut far against the curve. And, that was, and, and Seattle was having the great nightmare of regionalism, which is that regionalism means that a whole large suburban population which outnumbers the inner city just outvotes the inner city continuously and the inner city's needs never get met. That is often, that is the nightmare of what regionalism can turn into. And it's been a long process in Seattle breaking out of that, but they're finally getting there. So sorry for the graph, but I, this is such an important question. I thought I'd need to draw the graph. So the other thing to remember about this is that from different points of view, so people will think of this as equitable. This is subjective equity. Everybody has a bus every 40 minutes, right? Everybody has the same level of service. Then there's this kind of equity, which is proportionality to population, right? Twice as many people, twice as much service. Who could argue with that? Then there's this, which is equity based on actual demand. So whenever you hear the word equity in this business, always keep it in quotation marks, because it has multiple meanings, depending on the point of view. Sorry, sorry to go on on that, but that's the, I just thought that was important. There's more, a lot more on that in the book. So we only have one minute uh, left, and I think that's perhaps a really good, uh, important point to close on here, because I'm afraid that we'll go over. Otherwise, there was a bunch of questions still on the web. I apologize to our web viewers for not being able to convey those. Thank you very much for spending time with us today. Thank you very much. And I do, I do have four of these for